All right, this is study number four in the series Imagine All the People. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. So again, if you haven't read it, go ahead and you can pause the video and read it. Make notes, make any, um, ask questions, really digest it um, for yourself before we get into it. And then, um, yeah, and then we'll get into it after that. Okay, so basically this passage is Jesus has already, we had the Beatitudes, right? And Jesus outlined, imagine all the people, imagine this vision of the kingdom that he's been preaching about. The kingdom of heaven is has coming near, and what does it look like? Well, the Beatitudes are like, the kingdom belongs to these type of people. And it's very different than maybe what the Old Testament or ancient Jewish perception of the Old Testament was. Okay? And then, this, and then it gets into... Um, the vision is for to be salt and light, the city on the hill, for all these people to come and flow to Jerusalem and that the people of God would influence the rest of the world um, by being salt, being, being light. And then the last uh, section that we looked at was that Jesus is saying, no, I'm not contradicting all of the Old Testament. I'm not contradicting the law and the prophets. I'm actually fulfilling them. So... The question is, how does that? How does Jesus actually fulfill them? Like, okay, you're fulfilling them. You're not getting rid of any of the laws or the prophets. But what does that look like? What does that mean? So, Jesus goes into a series of of case studies, really, uh, where he's like, "This is an example," and he's giving an exa examples of what his how he is fulfilling the law. So. It says, and there's a number of these, you have heard it said, blank, 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 but I say to you, blank, blank, blank. Now, the form of that, you've heard it said this, but I say to you, it's kind of saying, I'm reinterpreting, or I'm giving you a different meaning than what you've been taught. You might have been taught to, you know, do X, Y, Z, but I'm telling you, this is a better way. That's kind of how it's structured. But in actuality, he's not actually controverting or contradicting what the Old Testament says. He's actually, in his word, his idea is to fulfill it. So what we'll see is he's actually going to a deeper level or finding the deeper meaning behind it. Here, in this, in this particular passage, we're talking about murder. Right? You've heard it said, you shall not murder. And wh whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So there's murder, and then there's the consequence, which is judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother um, will be, or whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So there's three levels, right? With anger, and you'll be liable to judgment. If you say, you fool, which is kind of like... Um, or no, whoever insults his brother, which is, it will be liable to the council, which is like a little bit maybe higher level. And then whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fires of hell, which is like the biggest level of judgment. Now, these three levels, I wouldn't read too much into it. It's more of a, a form just saying, hey, the anger, insult, or the worst kind of insult is like l levels of getting worse. But really, the entire point is the same point. So the entire point is that anger or insults are what's that uh, that like like feeling is what's behind murder, and there is going to be punishment for that. There is there is negative consequences for that those that. So what Jesus is saying here is he's saying it's not just that oh. Uh, murder is is wrong and that's it it's let's look at the intention behind that particular law the law can't talk about everything the law can't cover all scenarios but the meaning behind don't murder is hey let's get along with each other let's not have this anger or malice towards each other it it's not only that anger and malice leads to murder it's not just that but it's also that anger and malice and insults lead to other things too, which are all bad. All of those things are negative, right? And we'll see 
Uh, then the second part of the verse, is, it talks about reconciliation. So these two things are re- related. The anger, the bitterness, the hate towards a person will also, it, it means it's a broken relationship. Well, the, the corollary of that is if you have a broken relationship, the Bible want, or the or scripture is saying we, it needs to be fulfilled. It needs to be fixed, I mean. So basically what we have here is we have the people who are just going towards the minimum. It's like, okay, I don't kill anybody. I'm fine. I don't murder anyone. I'm fine. But Jesus is saying, no, that's not what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. The kingdom of heaven is much higher standard. It's the ideal. This is what we're shooting for. Imagine this. That any time you are angry with someone, you are going to repair that. Imagine this. If you are at the temple and you're sacrificing, you value reconciliation so much that you're going to go and find your brother and reconcile with him. That's basically the... um, message that jesus is trying to convey now what does the reconciliation part have to do with like the altars and all that and giving a gift that part is the altar and giving a gift and sacrificing to god and the temple is a way of reconciling a person to god and that was traditionally thought of as this is true spirituality but jesus is basically saying that's not true spirituality True spirituality is what is your relationship with your brother? Are you reconciled with your brother? Do you have anything against people? Do you have that bitterness eating away inside you? If you do, you better put a higher priority on that than even reconciling with God. And that's like was mind blowing, would have been mind blowing to an ancient Jewish person that what I'm supposed to make my relationship with my brother and reconciling with my brother that much more important. And that's, but that is what Jesus is saying. Don't be fake. Don't just say, oh yeah, I'm spiritual. Like I have a good relationship with God. But at the same time, you are, you know, you hate your brother. That's not real. And even in our day and in our church, maybe not our specific church, but maybe in our specific church, we have people who might be spiritual or act spiritual or say, oh, I I pray all the time. I read the Bible all the time. But then you look at their lives and they have broken relationships. They're holding on to bitterness. They're holding on to anger. That's serious business. And that's not true spirituality. True spirituality is reconciliation with your brother. Reconciliation with your brothers and sisters in church. Reconciliation with the community, with people you have something against. That's true spirituality. So we need to, that's the, uh, the type of life the type of kingdom that Jesus is trying to advocate. And we have to look at ourselves. Do we have real forgiveness in our church? And if we don't, then something's wrong. Do we have real reconciliation that happens? Do we even tell each other we're upset? Do we even try to work things out? Or is it just like everything swept under the rug? If we don't actually try to work things out, if we don't actually have... Uh, real reconciliation happening then we don't have real spirituality because that's at the heart of the gospel okay and so that's basically the application too it's to examine ourselves and say there are certain sins that our churches take really seriously and anger and bitterness generally actually isn't one of them if someone says oh yeah i'm a bit really angry that's like oh okay You're angry. Yeah, okay, that's fine. If someone confesses, oh, I, you know, I have a sex, sexual addiction. That's like, oh, no, like, that's like so bad. But the scripture is telling us that we need to take both very seriously, that we need to take anger just as seriously and bitterness just as seriously. And if we don't have that reconciliation going on, we don't have repairing of relationships, then something's really wrong with the church. And that's basically how we're supposed to look at, and this is a case study, and we're going to go in into it more with divorce, adultery, other things. But it's a case study. How are you supposed to read the Bible? How do you read the Bible? And you, if you look at it, Jesus is not reading the letter. 
He doesn't read the letter. Go, okay, well, this is exactly what it said, and this is what I need to obey. He doesn't do it that way. And so part of what we can take is also we shouldn't do it that way. We're supposed to be looking at the intent behind the laws. The this type of society is trying to create and go for that ideal society. And that's how we're really supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to read it with its intent and its heart behind it. And also with the eye towards Jesus fulfilling all of this. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus brings real reconciliation. And that's the type of life he modeled. And that's why he, every single one of these things that he's going to list, Jesus exemplifies. Right? He exemplified this on the cross. He exemplified reconciliation with human beings on the cross. And that's what he values. So that's part of what we need to take home too. Is Do we have any broken relationships in our lives? Are there things we need to get healed? And go ahead and maybe it's hard. But to just tell people you're sorry. That's like sometimes the hardest thing to do. Or to... Even approach someone and say, hey, let's talk this out rather than sweeping under the rug. That's some of the stuff's really hard to do, I admit. But these that's the direction we need to go in.